All right. Awesome. Thank you, Tanya. And thank you so much, Carell. Um, uh, these are some really amazing prizes. So uh, you must be in the live stream to be eligible. Um, but let's get to it. We've got a lot to cover today. I'm going to be working in Corel Painter 2017, and I'm working on a Wacom Intuos Pro Medium tablet. And I've got the extra art pen because I like the uh, swivel sensitivity since I do a little bit of calligraphy. And just to give myself a clean screen, I'm going to go ahead and open up a blank document. So I have got my workspace set up. And if you're not familiar with the workspace, that is it encompasses all of your palettes, your color management, your custom settings, um, even includes brushes and your library. Um, so Painter's done a really nice job with kind of keeping all of your customization, everything that you like in Painter, within what's called the workspace. And that can be found under Window and Workspace. And so typically, if you've never opened up Painter before, you'll see one that's called Default. Now I've got several of them set up. Um, depending on if I'm teaching or speaking or what I'm working on. So with what I'm working on right now, it's called Heather's Portrait 2017 Workspace. Um, what's also nice about the workspace is this is kind of the way to back up everything. So once you have everything in Painter that you like, you can go into Window, Workspace, Export Workspace, and it will compress everything into a zipped file and then you know store that somewhere, store it on the cloud, this is your backup if you want to you know, put it on a laptop or you get a new computer. And then you would load it by going Window, Workspace, Import Workspace. And it would load all of your customizations, um, all of your preferences, all of your color management. You know, Of course, double check and make sure everything takes. But within the same version of Painter, this is just a great way to back up all of your custom settings without having to go through and do all of that under you know, Corel Painter Preferences General, Canvas Color Management Settings, and then all of your palettes, which are found under Window. Um, it also remembers any um, layout customizations that you like, and the new palette drawers. So I have made a custom palette drawer called Layers and Brush Calibration. And if you have tuned in with me before, you know I'm left-handed. So I like everything on the left-hand side of my screen. And you can customize however you would like. I like keeping it a pretty relatively simple, clean screen because I like a lot of real estate and I like simple. I'm easily distracted, so I like to have you know a lot of visibility on a canvas and very few palettes. Now, key palettes that absolutely must be in view at all times. You know, one just to give me visibility of what I'm working on, and two for very simple troubleshooting because often it's user error. Um, are a couple things. We've got the Layers palette. You absolutely need to see this at all times. We have our Brush Calibration, and I'll show you in a second where you can find these. We have our Clone Source palette, our Color Wheel, our Toolbar, and our Brushes. Now, Brushes are typically found in this top left bar. Now, if you click on the dark gray part, you can move any of these palettes. If they are clumped together, you'd have to click on the word or the name of the palette to ungroup them. Now, we can put them together and create what's called a palette drawer. And if you click really closely, you can see this little gear. It's called a palette drawer. And we can rename them according to, um, I'd recommend renaming them according to function. But I want to see these two together here. Now, all of your palettes, can be found under Window. So if you have a checkbox next to them, it means they're open somewhere. If you are working with dual monitors, it's really nice to have it set up where you've got your palettes on one screen and your document on another. And you just have a very, very clean workflow. So we've got um, Brush Calibration can be found under Window, Brush Control Panels, Brush Calibration. And this guy is really good for giving you that extra bit of expressive sensitivity on your um, Wacom brush. And this is only uh, compatible with styluses or pens that have that extra sensitivity. So if you're working with a mouse, this is not going to help you. But let me show you. I've got an extra brush here. That's probably not loaded in this one. And. The brush sensitivity 
um, measures from the time you touch down to the time you lift up. So we can have, from end to end, a fairly boring kind of brush. It's very general on each end. Or if we turn that brush calibration on, you can see how it goes from light to dark. It's very expressive. So brush calibration is per brush. That can kind of help give you that extra sensitivity of both speed and pressure. So some of the brushes have that built in. And if you want to get really, really technical and build that yourself, all of that's found under window, brush control panels, and most of these. So you'll find something like that under what's called, um, I believe it's called expression. So pressure, anything that has expression next to it, that is basically your brush calibration sensitivity. And you can put it according to pressure. So that's getting really what we call geeky. I'm going to close that out. And we're going to keep it simple. So let's look at a few brushes. Um, I had pulled some of my favorite brushes that come with Corel Painter 2017. And I put them in a brush category. So all of these brushes actually come within Painter. And they are from various brush categories. Now, on the brushes palette, the left-hand side are called categories. The right-hand side are called variants. So within each category, you have all of its respective variants. So you've got several hundred different brushes to play with. Now, if at any time you want to make your own custom palette, all you have to do is hold down the Shift key. And you see that little green gear is popping up. Drag and drop. And now you have your own custom palette. And you can make this of all your favorite brushes, your favorite tools, your favorite presets, um, any kind of commands. And at any time, you can make this a palette drawer, rename it, you know, customize your workspace so it's very efficient for you. Or we can make a new category and keep all of our favorite brushes within, you know, that category. So I like keeping things very um, clean and actually pretty organized when everything else in my life is not organized, but this and Painter, they're pretty organized. So I've moved them all into one category. And I'll just go through these pretty quickly. I've got the Detail Oils brush, which is very, very expressive. I love this one. And this one you really have to set your brush calibration with. This is an awesome eyelash brush or an individual hair strand brush. And I will show you, when you turn brush calibration off, we'll make it a little bit larger. It just looks like a marker. It's not that special. But if you turn brush calibration on, enable brush calibration, you click that bottom right hand little icon. It brings up this window. And this is uh, Painter asking you, go ahead and give me a mark. And this is Painter measuring your weight and your speed from the time you touch down to the time you lift up. And it's only measuring that last mark you do. So you can doodle to your heart's content, but it's only measuring that last mark. So you can see the drastic marks here. Now watch the extreme difference here now. That expression is very, very sensitive according to speed and pressure. So now we get very, very expressive eyelashes. So the same brush from here to here, I didn't make any changes in my settings. All I did was turn on that brush calibration and went ahead and just did it my little stress test. There we go. So now I have these really nice expressive eyelashes. So that's a really great brush for eyelashes. That's my Detail Oils brush. We've got some pretty cool blenders. So Grainy Blender Angle Jitter. Grainy Blender, and these are from the Blender section. We have Impressionist, which is from the artist's favorite. And I think this is one of the all-time artist's historical favorite, is the Impressionist brush. It just gives you a very scattered brush. We've got Real Fat Chalk, and I have kind of put in um, quotation marks next to it. It's a great accent brush, and I'm going to explain why in just a second. We have the Sargent brush, which is also from the artist's favorites. And to me, this is just kind of like a greasy palette knife. This 
is really great for like sketching, blocking in color, large spaces, um, you know, necklines of fabric. We've got uh, the Smeary Round, which is one of my absolute favorites when you get to painting in skin. And then the Straight Cloner, which is going to be your Oops brush. So all of these brushes I've grabbed from categories within Painter. I'm going to clear this out, and we're going to talk a little bit about the technical stuff before diving into an actual painting. So up at the very top here, we've got our tool palette, and I'm going to be on brush while I'm talking about this. When I'm on brush, you'll see my little options bar up here reflects the current brush that's selected. So I'm going to pull my smeary round brush. At the very top left, we have the reset tool. I'm going to hit that. So it's going to reset the brush to its last saved settings. And you'll see that my, my little um, color wheel grays out. So that's telling me this brush is now in clone mode, meaning the brush is loading up an image and painting the image versus painting a color that I'm choosing. So we have the ability to either freehand paint with color, we can blend, or we can paint with an image. And painting with an image or cloning is what really makes Painter so incredibly powerful. Um, so in my paintings, I do a lot of cloning as a base, and then I freehand over top with a lot of color. But without that cloned base, um, you would have to be freehanding many, 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 many hours. And you just get that amount of realism, which you'll see in the demo here. So moving on, we've got our little spaghetti noodles. We have our freehand strokes. And then we have our constrained strokes. Uh, we have our align to path and perspective. I don't really use these as a portrait painter. Then moving over, I'm going to move my color wheel. If you hover over top of it long enough, it actually shows you and tells you what it is. This is your size. Next over, we have opacity. So we start to get into kind of the important part of brushology, which I call it. Let me clear this out. Let's pick a fun purple color. Now, opacity, I want you to think of in terms of coverage. So at 100% opacity and 10% opacity. Opacity is coverage. Moving over, we're going to skip feature. I'm going to come back to that one. Resaturation is how much stuff is loaded onto your brush. So don't think of in terms of color. I just want you to think of stuff. So resaturation is how much stuff is saturated onto your brush. So at 100%, it's fully, fully saturated. I'm just going to put some colors down. The beauty about taking your resaturation to zero, and listen up at this part. If you tune out the entire webinar, listen to this right here. Resaturation at zero turns your brush into, try this again, zero, a blender. So resaturation at zero means your brush has no paint on it. There is no stuff on it, yet the brush is still active. So if your brush has a resaturation field, it can now be a blender. Now what determines how smoothly it blends is the bleed field. At 100%, it should give you a very smooth bleed, smooth blending. At 0%, it's very, very harsh. It lands on a pixel, and it drags it until you release. So bleed at 0. I'm sorry, this should read 0. There we go. At bleed at 0 is a very harsh, aggressive blender. A bleed at 100 is a very smooth, feathered, gradated, very, very smooth blender. Now where this comes in handy is when you're painting skin and hair and you want that smooth, porcelain, feathered, um, buffed, beautiful, finished, makeup look, 100% bleed is going to be your best friend. So it'll 100% bleed. And I'm going to lower my opacity. Remember, we, that's coverage. Look how nice and smooth that is. 
smooth, smooth, smooth. So bleed at 100 is nice and smooth, regardless if you're in color mode or you're blending or you're cloning. If you want it smooth, boost your bleed. If you want it chunky, take your bleed to zero. So hopefully that will make sense. Now going back to feature, let's put something in our reset field. Pick out another fun color. With spring, we've got fun colors. Feature is the space between your bristles when you have a bristle-based brush. So when we plop down, I'm going to turn my brush calibration off because it's trying to read my pressure. You can see that's at 25. Let's do 10. Let's do 10 again. Try that. There we go. And let's do 5. We've got 25, 10, and 5. So feature is the space between your bristle hairs. And essentially, feature is what determines how bristly your brush is or how scratchy your brush is. So a high feature, this right here is 25, 10, and 5. A high feature is very bristly, very scratchy. A low feature is very solid. If we were to go down to 1, let me make that same size brush, go down to 1. That is giving us such small space between our bristles that we have such a solid brush, it looks like a marker. Now, because the little blue lock next to it is highlighted, this means that that feature is automatically scaling when you change your brush size. So as you're changing your brush size, let's pick something we actually like. Let's put 7 in there. Uh, let's go a little higher. Let's go to 10. There we go. So say you like this in your marks, and we decide to resize our brush. You'll notice that my brush's feature is automatically resizing or scaling according to that size. So luckily, we don't have to change that feature every single time we resize our brush. Now remember, this settings bar, this options bar, is per brush. So every time we change brushes, this is going to change. So hopefully these, these settings are starting to make sense. Now this video is going to be recorded and posted later for you to watch. So I really encourage you to kind of watch these settings and kind of get that in your head because this makes it easy to customize how you paint and control your skin. So let's talk about one more thing here. Um, let's do real fat chalk. And the real fat chalk, I would consider a shape-based brush. And shape-based brushes are really great for one major thing. They are awesome for texture. So it's like using a potato or a stamp. You get gorgeous paper texture. And paper texture is found on your tools palette at that bottom square. It defaults to basic paper. And they have a wide variety of paper types already preset in Painter. But you can build some. You can load some. Um, there are wonderful resources all over the internet for them for free ones. I personally love the Artist Canvas. And I have been in love with it for a decade. And I'm hard pressed to change it because I just I love that this brings up Canvas. So you can control the degree or how much paper texture shows through your brush by the amount of grain. So the grain feature is right next to that little paper texture brush uh, box. And if we lower the grain, you can see that we get just a little hint of paper texture. If we raise the grain, we really obliterate the paper texture. So you know, in the real world, this would be like smushing your chalk into the paper so heavily that you just get rid of all the paper altogether. So I try to keep my grain settings really low. Um, I try to keep them under 15%. I find like 5 to 10 is my happy place. That might be a little heavy. Let's do about 7% is pretty good. Now what's nice about paper texture is you can change it at any point and get a really cool look. So if we were to change this and go over top of that, we get a different look entirely. Go back with another color. 
we'll change it over to marbled. So if you're doing more um, illustrative, illustrative work, you can get a very different look with just changing your paper texture. So a lot of shape-based brushes, and you can tell it's a shape-based brush just by looking at my nib, will pull up paper texture, whereas a lot of this bristle-based brushes don't pull up so much paper texture. Some of them do, not all of them do. All right, so let's get into the actual painting itself. I have got a portrait of an adorable little boy, and I retouched it first, did all my sizing, and it's a huge layered file. I just wanted to show you what I started with. Probably should have resized it first. So let me pull up my layers. You might hear some babbling in the background. I've got somebody awake. So this is the original. And I retouched them. Just a little bit of under the eye bag. I boosted some of the highlights in the shadows. Just gave it a little bit of extra pop. I find when you are painting a subject that as you're working with your values, meaning your lights to darks, they tend to flatten out just a bit as we start to blend. So I find a little bit of over-exaggeration helps avoid having that flat, waxy skin look. And it's just a little tiny boost. So however you like to do it, whether it's dodging and burning or using Michelle Parsley's awesome Photoshop techniques from Photoshop Artisan, um, there's so many different ways to do it, using Nick filters, whatever your way to do it. Uh, boost your values because they're going to flatten out as you paint them. I added some of my grayish painted backgrounds behind them to give myself just a little bit of um, texture in that background because I just wanted to focus on skin today. Now these felt a little bit too cool against him and he's got these gorgeous blue eyes so I just put a little bit of blue, just a hint. And it doesn't look like it's taking in there because I did this in another program. But let's actually open up the final file. I went ahead and cropped it as a square and gave it a little bit of that vignetted look. Hi, do you want to say hello? I have my little 14-month-old here. Can you say hi? Yeah. <laughs> this is Shia. Can you say hello? Yes, she's waving. So hi, world. <laughs> um, so when I have a fully painted background, already in my image, I typically start out with file clone. If the image is straight photographic, I start file quick clone. Um, because part of it's already been painted, I'm going to go ahead and do file clone. Now it has made a duplicate document and it's now named Untitled 2. We're going to mount it. I'm on a Mac, so all of my shortcuts are going to start out as command. If you're on a PC, it's going to be control. So command M for mount. Space bar is going to be my mover tool. And I'm going to look at my clone source palette and take my tracing paper to zero. Now tracing paper, and you're not going to see anything until we make a mark, so let's make a crazy mark here. Make a heavy mark. I'm going to set my paper to artist canvas. There we go. Tracing paper, and this is in all of the other webinars if you want to watch, all of my other webinars if you want to watch what tracing paper is. Tracing paper is simply a projection of your source file that's loaded in your clone source palette. So it's not a hidden layer. It's not under your canvas. It is not in your document physically. It is simply a projection. So it's a nice tool to be able to help you see what you're cloning with. Um, so remember, in clone mode, which you can turn any brush, well, most brushes into cloner brushes, simply by going to your color wheel, clicking on the clone stamp icon, if you see this grayed out, it now turns your brush into a clone brush. And I'm going to show you in just a second here. So let's get into that. Um, let's go to our smeary round brush. Well, you know what? Let me fix this. This is kind of a mess. I'm going to go to Straight Cloner, and this will save my butt because I made a mess. So let's go to Smeary Round. 
when I'm working on skin, if I want that smooth, classical look, I tend to go with round brushes. Round brushes give you a high degree of control, um, a high degree of smoothness, really nice classical photorealism, and you just, they're gorgeous. So Smeary Round, this is from the oils section. So I've made a few adjustments here. I'm going to start out with these settings. I'm going to zoom in here so you can see what I'm doing. Um, my size is going to change, but for the most part, um, I'm going to start out with a 30% opacity. I'm going to start low because I'm kind of a chicken. My feature, we're going to make a few test marks, but I'm going to start out at 5 and see how we go. Remember, features, how scratchy it is. My resaturation is 15. Resaturation, when you're in clone mode, is how much detail you're bringing back. Remember, in color mode, it's how much stuff is on your brush. In clone mode, it's how much detail is on your brush. So I found in clone mode, the happy place is really between 10 and 20 percent. When I'm painting, unless I am doing an oops brush, like I just did with that um, details when I brought back everything, it's really, you'll notice all of my cloning brushes for portraits are never below, I'm sorry, never above 20 percent. So 15 is really a happy place. When I want smooth skin, my bleed is typically always about 100 percent for very, very smooth skin. So as for cloning, you can see how nice and smooth that is, and I'm doing very, very heavy marks to show you how much, you know, how much this is picking up. I'm going to show you um, a few, well, just thought process behind skin. There we go. I like that mark. I'm going to do this in a separate layer just to show you, you know, brain mapping, what my brain is seeing here. And I'm going to give a few different marks here. So the key to getting really nice, clean, realistic skin without it looking like a wax figure is keeping your values, meaning your lights to darks, in the proper place and not stretching them. So when I look at this, I'm squinting down um, and I'm looking at places in terms of value. So don't look at this is the eyes, this is the nose, this is the mouth. Forget all that right now. What we're looking at is in terms of, okay, I've got shadow here, got shadow here, shadow here, shadow here, shadow, shadow, shadow. You're going to hate me saying this after a while. Shadow, okay, shadow. Then we've got, you know, mid-tone, mid-tone, mid-tone. If you get these wrong, that's fine. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to almost create a grid or like a paint by number fragmented section in my brain for where my brush can start and stop. So when we, you know, look at where those sections of transition are between highlight, midtone, and shadow, this means that when you start brushing in your skin, you cannot put your brush down and just start going blah 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 blah. Because what happens is your values start to smush into each other, especially with a heavy brush, and you get wax. You get that awful, waxy, like melted face look, and you lose the contour, you lose the volume. So what this is telling me is when I'm doing skin, I pretty much want to stay in those, those regions. If I cross over the regions, which is fine, do it very, very lightly, but don't take a region and go, bleh, that's not good when you're doing brush work. You're going to pinch stuff. You're going to make it waxy. So stay within those regions. If you cross the region, that's fine. Just go lightly and be careful that your, your values are not stepping into the wrong region. Your highlights need to stay in your highlights. Your midtones need to stay in your midtones. And your shadows need to stay in your shadows. Now, another thing that this is doing, too, is when I'm looking at this, let's do another one is to be able to get um, volume on his face. We can't be sloppy when we're painting uh, skin. So don't just start painting up and down, um, blah, 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 because what happens is it looks like you've compressed something against a piece of glass. It's flattened out your form. So instead of this, what we need to do is think of this as, you know, something over an armature. 
So we need to look at planes and curves of the face. Um, so when you do your brush work, hello, <laughs> do this. When you do your brush work, now contour your brushes. And you can do this both on a vertical and a horizontal axis. This will give the appearance that your painting is, you know, it has volume, it has form. We can go on the horizontal axis, axes. So if we were to turn that off, this actually looks like it's round and it's coming forward and it has form versus if we were just to paint like this, this has no form, it's flat. So all of those are kind of going on in my head when I'm looking at a face or when I'm looking at a pet or something that has form. It's not a flat structure. So I'm going to take this smeary round brush. I'm going to hit reset after all those little numbers I've showed you. And I'm making a crazy test mark. Without your test mark, you're going to drive yourself nuts. So make a really heavy test mark. You can always undo it by going Command Z or Edit Undo. And I'm looking for three things. Is my size? correct? Is my scratchiness or feature compatible? Is it, is it okay here? No. My size is a little big. My feature is way too big. And then lastly, is my opacity or my coverage heavy enough? The opacity is probably a little bit light. But first of all, let's take care of the sizing. I'm going to go a little bit smaller, and I'm going to take care of the big forms of the face first. All right. Size-wise, I'm okay there. That's all right. Opacity, that's really light. So let's go up to 50. Go to 40. I'm going to chicken out. All right, I'm happy with that. All right, that feature, though, is a little scratchy. So at right now, it's at 4.4. Let's drop this to 4. I'm a little happier with that. I think it's a little scratchy still. Uh, let's go to 3.8. The feature is really sensitive. And it does change per size of your brush, per size of your document, so you just have to play with it. And this is why I'm making a very in-your-face test mark. And edit Undo. All right, I am very happy with this brush. When you make brush changes and you like them so much, save your brushes. So I would go to Brushes, Save Variant, and name it according to functions. So name it something like a basic skin cloner and it will automatically save it to whatever current category you're in. So I'm going to zoom into that face nice and close, Command plus, and I'm going to resize that brush. And I can resize it up here, or I love the shortcut to this. It's Command Option on a uh, Mac or Control Alt on a PC. And I am brushing in, and my whole point in Painter is to, excuse me, brush the entire bit entire canvas. We want to get rid of all those photographic pixels. And I am doing um, contoured brush work. I'm starting to chicken out here at 40%. My brush is getting a little bit big. So let's go a little bit smaller. And I'm going to drop it to 20%. Command T. Let's toggle that tracing paper. And you'll notice I'm not doing this. I'm trying to stay within those little regions, and I'm, com I'm command teeing or toggling my tracing paper to make sure I'm not dropping any highlights. I'm not changing bone structure. I'm not changing the lighting pattern on his face. If you change the lighting pattern or you change any kind of features on the face, the parents are going to notice something might be off with the, the painting, they may not be able to put their finger on it, but they're going to look at it and go, oh, something's not quite right. Now, if you want a little cheat trick, if you have absolutely no idea how to contour a face, just do lots of little circles with your brushwork at a light opacity. And light right now for me is 20%. Now, if this brush fights you, meaning I'm getting weird pinchy marks, I can't get it to show right now because it's not actually fighting me. But when it fights you, you know it. Just turn your brush calibration off. Right now it's enabled. And what that's doing is when I have heavy pressure, I get a bigger mark. When I have lighter pressure, it gets a little bit smaller. 
But if your brush bites you, just turn your brush calibration off. So I am, and I'm lifting up. So if you could see me in color, I'm doing this. And I'm lifting in between all these sections. So this is a ton of brush work, and I'm going very quickly so I can try to get through a lot today. This time is flying by, my goodness. Now this brush is also amazing in color. So if we were to turn this back into color mode, we can exaggerate our colors here in these cheeks because this is nice, but we have a lot of um, opportunity here to exaggerate these gorgeous tones in the face, especially when you offer um, some kind of lighting setup that's not flat lit on your portrait. So if we were to take our dropper tool, which is D on your keyboard, and we were to exaggerate that color, because if we put the same color down, nothing really changes. So let's push that color. I love Helen Yancey. She says lighter and brighter. So you know, highlights would go lighter and brighter. Midtones would go a little bit more saturated, give more punch. Uh, deep tones would go a little bit deeper. So let's give it a little bit more punch. And just put a little bit more color right there. Take our highlight, go a little bit lighter and brighter. You'll notice I didn't change any of these. I'm just changing my size and my opacity because I'm chickening out. And heck, let's get a little bit more saturation, just a hint in these cheeks. I'm doing little, little tiny marks. I mean, it's barely perceptible here. Very, very light brush work. The more you can freehand, this is considered freehanding because we're in color mode right now the more painterly and handcrafted these are going to look. Very nice. Going to look at this. So far I'm not changing bone structure, so this is good. Now if you ever feel like you've gone way overboard and you're like, I need to blend some stuff, pick up a blender, or we can take our resaturation to zero. Remember, resaturation is how much stuff is loaded on your brush. We're in color mode. So resaturation at zero means we can now blend. So we can just lightly blend if we feel like we've gone too heavy. I'm pretty happy with that. I'm going to do a file save as. And you'll see it comes up as a RIF file. So this is my trick for saving. You can save however you would like. I'm going to go in and find my original file name. And I can tell it's been retouched and ready because for me I named them prep. And in front I'm going to name it 1PTR to tell myself it's the first stage in Painter. And I'm going to save this actually as an uncompressed Photoshop file because I print from Photoshop. So if you save it as Corel's native RIF format, you can't open it up in Photoshop. Um, but I start and finish in Photoshop, so I'm going to save it as a Photoshop document. Painter's going to say, wait a minute, it's not a RIF, and we're going to say it's okay. Now, if you want heavier skin, more pastel or impressionistic skin, use different brushes. Use flat brushes, use textured brushes. I'm going to show you with this real fat chalk. Remember, this is under, I think it's chalk brushes, chalk, pastel, and crayons. These chalk brushes are gorgeous, but you have to pair it with the right paper texture. I found paired with something like the basic paper, just it didn't look great to me. But if you pair it with like a watercolor or an artist canvas, it's gorgeous, regardless of what kind of paper type you're printing on. So I've used this thing for the last 14 years on regardless of canvas or watercolor paper or luster paper because it gives me just a hint of texture. So if we were to sample, boost that color just a little bit, let me hit reset so it shows up exactly like you would see it. And these are my settings right here I'm going to start with. 40 opacity, 20 grain, 40 reset, 40 bleed. On that real fat chalk, this is an awesome accent brush. So if you need highlights in clothing, highlights in hair, highlights on skin, this is your brush. There we go. Oop. We're going to pretend the nose was painted. Not time is just flying by, and I want to do a little bit of hair before we finish up. But give yourself a really nice cloned base before you start painting in your freehand work. This brush is fabulous for reflected highlights, and it's also 
um, brush calibration, I think it's, I either turned it on or it was turned on with this brush. It's a very expressive brush. Let me turn on a color that you can actually see. So, you know, light, light pressure, small brush, heavy pressure, heavy brush. So you can see, you know, you could hand write with this brush. It's very expressive. And that's the way I like to paint. So if I were doing a little bit of like calligraphy work, this is very sketchy for me. I love that look. So I would carry that uh, whole look on in the rest of the face. Now let me take the last few minutes and do some hair. The round brushes that work in the face work beautifully in hair. And this is the same way with um, animal. And I might beep out here because somebody's trying to call me. So bear with me. But round Round brushes are great on hair. So let's go back and hit that clone mode again. And I'm going to follow the root of the hair. Um, you know what? Let me hit reset because that didn't look great. Now we're talking. There we go. And I'm sketching back and forth. It's getting a little bit muddy because I'm not I don't have a small enough brush. I'm getting, I'm getting lazy. Let's try this again. Let's do a little bit of a smaller brush. And I'm following the hair. Got to do a Command T. Take a look. We've got a really, really nice range of highlights and shadows. So remember, those shadows need to stay in shadows. Those highlights need to stay in highlights. So that's going to give it that silky look. So give yourself a really nice cloned face before you start freehanding. Because, you know, you've got to get rid of those photographic pixels for it to read as a painting. If you have freehand work over top of a, a photographic print, it might read very differently. And I want people to read these as, oh, that's a painting, not, well, some of it looks painted, but I still see photographs because that gets confusing when it comes time for them to write the paycheck. So you can see it gives us this really nice, smooth, lustry look. Now let's pull in. Say we want to give some more detail. We want more control. If you want to bring back some more detail in that hair, boost your reset in clone mode. So let's boost that up to about 30. You've got to be careful with that reset because at a point it brings back a little bit too much detail, which to me this is a little bit, this is pushing it. This is getting a little borderline photographic. And I try not to rely heavily on blending because the more you blend, the more ghostly or the more waxy it gets. You just kind of lose, um, you know, integrity of the, the file. It just goes flat. Let's boost that down. I'm sorry, let's drop it down to about 20. So, and I'm following the way that that hair lies, because if you don't, it's just going to look very choppy. And I want that classical realism. And you can go as heavily as you want, but for today, I'm just showing you a little bit more controlled look. So you can see, very, very nice. Now, to enhance this, to take it a step further, we can use this in color. Or we can take that detail oil brush, let me hit reset. And these are my settings. That opacity is going to drop. Let's go to 30. Oh, yeah, 30%. Here we go. And this is a gorgeous little individual hairbrush. We can give, I'm sampling. I'm going back to my brush very quickly. D, 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 dropper brush, dropper brush. So we're finishing edges. So it makes sense where it completes the edge to that background. We can give more contrast. We can continue to build up some of those mid-tones if we wanted to. You can give that wispy hair look by filling in hair or extending it. This, this little brush is really great for individual hairs. Or if you want to fake a hair light, this is your brush. Now, if you want a brush that has a little bit more texture for hair, I go back to that real fat chalk. 
those that have my um, my brush set, this is the uh, color square chalk equivalent. We'll get a little bit brighter here. I kind of like that. Now I'm going to show you one of my favorite brushes that I have in one of my custom sets. And this is from most of them actually. And this is called my Wispy Blender. So we're going to take the Wispy Blender and just go whoop. Gives it that nice little breeze of air. This gives that little hint of uh, flying hair that you get in the Ethereal series. There we go. A little untamed. So Tanya, why don't we open it up to questions? I'm just watching the clock here. OK, sorry about that. I had to get myself off mute. Um, sure. So just out of curiosity of everybody here, they would love to see if you have this finished painting. No. You <laughs> oh, you didn't finish? OK. OK, not a big deal. Um, so there are some basic questions that came in, and I may have just missed it in the beginning while answering what was okay. coming through the questions panel. Which Wacom tablet are you using right now? Uh, let's see. It is the Intuist Pro Medium. Okay. That's what I thought you were using. And I've got the art pen hooked up to it because the calligraphy that I do requires the art pen. You've just got to go with that. It's awesome. Yeah, it's great for rotation on so yeah. many of Peter's brushes that allow for that. And then the other basic thing is what canvas size and DPI do you typically work with? Because I know you print most of your work. Yes. Oh. Yes, they print very large. Um, Canvas-wise, the basic rule of thumb is you want your final size minimum to be at 100 dpi. So, um, you know, 24 by 30 minimum would be 2400 by 3000 pixels. I paint at 300 dpi, so um, a minimum would be an 8 by 10 at 300, but I paint at half, meaning uh, 24 by 30 would be like a, what is that, a 12 by 15 at 300 if I have that big of a file. Uh, this one, let's see, canvas size. This is actually pretty big. So if I were to look at just the pixels, this is telling me that we could print up to a 39 by 37. So if we just move the decimal point over, that that's the max size it could go as a painting. Um, I think I have a cheat sheet somewhere that I would be happy to post. Okay, I'm sure everybody would love that. Yeah, um, shoot, you know what, I am happy to post that. I will post it on my Facebook page. If they check me out on Facebook, I'm at Heather Michelle the Painter. I will post that on my Facebook page um, because it, it shows the math to it on bare minimum than like your happy place and your bare minimum because it's a lot of math. <laughs> I don't quite like okay. know. It's the, it's the number one question that we get. <laughs> the two questions are always, what tablet are you using and what, you know, how should I set up my document? So that would be very helpful. Oh, yeah. And it, and I print large. I mean, the normal size is 24 by 30, 30 by 40. So um, I paint large for that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, do you happen to know, and this might be difficult to answer on the fly, but will your brushes work in versions of Painter earlier than 2017? The uh, brush packs on my store um, will say what versions they're compatible with. Okay. Um, the three-day brush pack that I'm showing right now is only with 2017, unfortunately. Okay. Good to yeah. know. Um, you can buy your brushes right on heatherthepainter.com. Uh, heatherthepainterstore.com. And okay. I believe they're on sale. One of them's on like serious discount just because of today. Uh, and they're only on sale for a week. So um, they're all of these guys. And I use these every day in every single brush. And up until um, this week when I launched them, they were only available to students. So uh, go get them. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that's fantastic. Yeah, um, yeah they're I'm, awesome. Sorry, kind of there's all these questions coming in right now, and I already had a list of questions from people that entered them early. So, 
Um, how did you, there's questions about your background. It's obviously painted already. Um, would you, let's see here, the question is that people are wondering, do you typically work in layers? Because I see you're working right on the canvas now. Good question. No, um, the only time I ever work in layers is when I'm doing eyelashes. And that's just from having, um, working in that file quick clone or file clone mode. Um, I find because I work so large, it the layers just slows me down and it makes the file sizes huge. I just don't, I don't like working in layers, but that's personal preference. Um, some of the brushes I have, I think like the Wispy Blender, it doesn't work as well in the layers. Um, so if people are comfortable working in layers and having to adjust the opacity, that's fine. If you're going to work in a layer, just make sure this little blue guy, pick up underlying colors, blue is selected. Um, that's, that's really important, but no, I, the only time I work with the layer is when I do eyelashes, which I'll do here as I'm answering questions. Okay. Yeah. There were questions about, and I did post the keyboard shortcut, but how do you resize your brush? Are you using the wheel on the tablet or keyboard command? Question. Um, keyboard command, that is command option and draw a circle. Okay. Yeah, and that's a Mac. So control, um, PC people, it's control alt. Those eyelashes are really long. Um, but going back to that layers thing, the reason I do the eyelashes on a separate layer is because I can always delete the edges. I can erase if I go too crazy with them. Right. Or we can just well, drop down that. How do you merge your painted background with the subject prior to bringing it in Painter? Because you already had that done, right? Do you just use Photoshop? Um, I, did, I did the editing in Photoshop. Just I liked I, I liked doing um, their skin controls with the uh, on the skin, so I'm comfortable there. Um, basic layer masking, and you can actually do that in Painter. They've got layer masking here. Um, so you either mask out your subject entirely or you would overlay it on, like he was on just a basic gray background, and then just change your layer mode to your background. So when we had opened him up, and I can show you. That big file. So he was... Um, Pull this out so you can see all the layers. He was on just a basic background, which it really helps if you're shooting either on a green screen or a basic gray. And I wanted something with depth on it. I typically hand paint them in, but when it's when I'm pressed for time and I'm showing just skin, it's really helpful to have something finished behind it. So I have different sets of finished hand painted backgrounds. So I dropped this in over top of them. And I found that the tones were a little off, so I dropped in another one, and I changed it to multiply mode, which just darkened it. And then I threw in another one just to kind of blue it up, because I wanted to pull out the blues in his eyes. And then I just threw a color balance, which isn't showing in here, because I think it's only a Photoshop thing. Um, and then I just layer masked him over top. So if I needed to move him around at all, I could move him. Okay, perfect. So yeah, you could mask out your subject, or you could just throw, you know, a layer mode change. Okay, so Lisa was asking, um, you know, if you do accidentally, I can't speak, accidentally brush the edge of the background and mess it up, you could just clone that back in if need be. Yeah, if you mess up something really badly, um, you can either clone in with, Go with your skin brush, or if you have a really bad oops, just go with your straight cloner. And that's found under your cloner brushes. So like right here, I've totally messed it up. Just go back with your straight cloner. Okay, good. And then just to clarify, I know you have mentioned this, but for those of you still wondering about the clone source color, if you choose a brush that is not a cloner in the color wheel, you just click the clone source button and then that will paint with the colors from whatever clone source that you're working with. Yes. Okay, let's if, see. 
if I've missed anything else here. Um, and some brushes just won't clone, and you'll see that very quickly. They'll just start blending. But most brushes will. They have capability of loading with an image. When you added strands of hair in, I miss this also, um, Phyllis is wondering, were you using the smeary round or if you wanted to add more strands, is that the brush you would use? Now, yeah, that's a really good question. Smeary round I would use if you want to have big chunks of hair, so if you're doing really large areas of hair. The detail oils brush I do for individual hair strands when I really want to build up um, lots of control over them. So if you want to do, let me do it this way. Um, start out with like large sections or block in chunks of hair, do smeary round first, and then build up with your detail oils. I changed over to that real fat chalk because it gives you that um, bit of texture. So this would be like the real fat chalk right here. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you can blend it with a blender version of your smeary round, or we didn't even get to the grainy blender, but you can take your grainy blender. It's a little different. It's a little bit more ghost, ghostly, I guess. You can see it's nice and soft. Do you ever leave the textured chalk rather than blending? Say that again? Do you ever leave, um, you know how you laid down the chalk texture, would you ever leave that without then going over and blending it? All the time, yep, absolutely. And Tan would like to know, can she purchase your wispy blender? I don't know if you know <laughs> if that's included in one of your brush packs. Yes, absolutely. Here's an example of leaving that hair. So, um, yeah. Absolutely. Wispy Blender is, and that's one of my all-time favorites, that's in the Everyday Brushes pack. Um, yeah, that is, that's all of my ethereal hair is Wispy Blender. So, okay, Heather, that's great because many people are asking for that. Um, Sheila, and I think, you know, at this point I'm going to ask you this one more question and then anything that we didn't get to address we will follow up with. I think for the most part um, we were able to answer all the questions, but Sheila says that sometimes okay. he struggles with the relationship between opacity and resaturation. And if you wanted okay. to add more color, which one do you increase? Um, if you're in color mode, in, they kind of go hand in hand. So, you know, opacity being the amount of coverage. If you've got your brush set to a very light coverage, it doesn't matter how much stuff is loaded onto your brush. So say we have our brush fully loaded with stuff, but our, our opacity is only at 10%. We're still, you know, fighting to put stuff down. Um, so, I find that if you want a heavier brush mark, boost your opacity first. So you can see this was 100% opacity, 100% feature. This is 10% opacity, 100%, I'm sorry, 10% opacity, 100% 100 reset. Let's see, 10, 100, and then this is 100, 100. So it depends on what your goal is. If you want more color, boost your reset if you want a heavier brush mark, boost your opacity, because they do go hand in hand, um, and that's in color mode. So if we were to drop our opacity down, let's say, let's go back down to 20%, and then we'd have 10 and 20 and 120. So at 120, we get this. At 10 and 20, we get that. So. Opacity really is how heavy your brush mark is or how aggressive your brush mark is. Resaturation is how much stuff you're going to get. So if you want a lot more color, increase your resaturation. But on the next side over, bleed also determines how much it's already blending with your existing painting, so drop your bleed. Because if your bleed's really high, it's going to already start to blend. So I hope that helps and doesn't get confusing. But yes, resaturation determines, you know, it helps with how much color is being applied. So boost your reset. Okay, thank you. I th it appears to have helped because I don't see anything in the questions panel here. And I said I was not going to ask any more questions. But do you have a particular brush you use for eyes? 
Um, I use the same brushes I use for skin and eyes, so that Skin Smooth, um, or that, I'm sorry, that Smeary Round I use in the base of the eyes is, I love it, and the eyes, and both in clone mode and color mode. And if you get really tiny, you can go pull up that Detail Oils brush. All those little nooks and crannies. So basically, the entire face, if you needed just one brush, it would be that Smeary Round. Sorry, I, I just can't believe how quickly that hour went by. This is absolutely oh. fantastic. Um, I had many people say that this is one of the best webinars that they've seen. They learned a ton. And I love that your techniques are easy to follow. Heather, thank you so much for today. And thank I'll you. follow up with all the information for everybody and for you immediately following this. Mm -hmm.